Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on, in the Public Health Webinar Series on Blood Disorders. This webinar is presented by the Division of Blood Disorders at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC. I'm Dr. Hany Alston Carey, and I'm, assist, I'm, I'm an assistant professor of medicine uh, at Harvard Medical School. I also serve as a clinical investigator in the Division of Hematology Oncology at the Massachusetts General Hospital and the co-director of the Massachusetts General Hospital Hereditary Hemorrhagic Telangiectasia Center of Excellence. I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Raj Kasturi, who is professor of medicine at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. He directs the Hereditary Hemorrhagic Telangiectasia Center of Excellence at UNC Chapel Hill. Dr. Kasturi is also the Associate Director for Clinical Research at the UNC Blood Research Center. We're both delighted to be with you today. Our topic today is Hereditary Hemorrhagic Telangiectasia in 2021, Diagnosis and Advances in Treatment. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few points uh, for joining this webinar. Upon joining the webinar, you'll see two audio options. You can opt to listen via the speakers on your device or by using your phone to call in. If the phone option is chosen, the webinar toolbar will provide you with the phone and access number and the audio pin. All audio will be muted. At the end of the presentation, there'll be time for questions. To submit a question, uh, please uh, use the questions area of your toolbar. Dr. Kasturi and I will respond to as many questions as time allows. Today's webinar will last approximately one hour and will be recorded. We'll begin with two brief audience polls. The first question, uh, and the first poll question uh, will be brought up now. There we go. So uh, please let us know a little bit more about you. Uh, please select your response to the poll question now. All right, so uh, about 80% are physician, physicians, nurses, other healthcare providers, and then we have a small smattering of other uh, uh, individuals. All right, next we'll move on to our second poll question. Just to learn what part of the world you are in, please make a selection now. All right, so uh, mostly North America, but some uh, uh, viewing the webinar from elsewhere. Uh, welcome to all. All right, so we will begin uh, with Dr. Kasturi, who will present on diagnosis in HHT and management of anemia in HHT. After that, I'll discuss the treatment of bleeding in HHT with a focus on anti-angiogenic agents and briefly touch upon the recently updated international HHT guidelines. Welcome again, Dr. Kasturi, and take it away. Thank you, Han. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Here are my disclosures for today. I was and am a member of the second international HHT working group guidelines, uh, that, and I have no other conflicts that are relevant to today's talk. Our objectives, um, and here they are listed, um, is to give you an overview of HHT, talk a little bit about the burden of iron deficiency and iron deficiency and anemia uh, in HHT. And I'll cover a little bit about various aspects of management of HHT before handing it off to Dr. Al Sankari to complete the rest of the webinar. Let me start with a case to set this up for us. This is a patient that I saw a few years ago, a 27-year-old man who went to his local provider to establish care. He felt he was healthy. He was exercising regularly. And review of systems was only significant for him reporting a history of nosebleeds that he started to develop as a teenager. At the time he saw the physician, he said he was getting nosebleeds about two to three times a week mild, not really bothering him much. He did have a history of having to go to an emergency room many years ago for a nosebleed that then required cauterization by an ENT provider. No other past medical history, 
drinks two beers a day. And family history was significant for both his siblings also having a history of nosebleeds. And father, who died at the age of 44, also having a history of nosebleeds. So when you see a case like this as hematologists, the first thing that comes to our mind is we think about primary hemostatic defects. We think about a patient that the patient probably has. One Wolbrand's disease is the most common inherited bleeding disorder. And if workup for that is negative, we'll probably go down the route of evaluating this person for a function defect, which would be appropriate. But then we get a little more uh, to the story here. On exam at the local provider, his oxygen saturation was 91%. So he was hypoxic. Exam otherwise reported to be normal. Because of the hypoxia, the patient was referred to a pulmonologist who got a CT scan of the chest that revealed pulmonary AVMs in both lungs. And that caused them to think about HHT on the differential and send the patient to me. Uh, when I saw him, my examination revealed that he did have telangiectasias in, in his fingers um, or in the perioral area over his lips. Um, and we had the, um, the pulmonary AVMs embolized. We screened his brain and, and found an intracranial AVM that also then was treated subsequently. So, and, and I put this case up because this is not uncommonly what we see in our HHT clinics. Uh, if this person had not sought care with, his, with a primary care provider, and, and most 27 year olds probably don't, um, he would have gone on, dealt with nosebleeds until they got to a point where they were a significant burden to him, or until the time he developed some complication from these pulmonary or brain AVMs that he had. Making a case for awareness, education, and early diagnosis to, to prevent adverse outcomes. Okay, so what is HHT? It's an autosomal dominant multi system blood vessel disorder that causes recurrent spontaneous nosebleeds. It occurs because of defects in angiogenesis that result in the development of telangiectasias over mucocutaneous surfaces or when the same happens in visceral organs, arteriovenous malformations. It has a wide range of clinical manifestations. In terms of epidemiology, the prevalence of HHT is estimated to be around one in 5,000 to one in 10,000. So I'd estimate about 70,000 people in the United States have HHT. There is a slight female preponderance. It seems to affect all races equally. And that is what I see in my practice has been my experience. And it's important to note HHT is a bleeding disorder. Maybe not your classic bleeding disorder because of a coagulation factor deficiency in the plasma, but it is an inherited bleeding disorder. And based on the prevalence estimates and the number of patients affected, it would be the second most common inherited bleeding disorder after one Wilbrand's disease. In terms of genetics, 85 to 90% of HHT happens because of mutations uh, in genes coding for endoglin or, AC, uh, or the ACBRL1 gene or ALK1. A smaller percent, about 2 to 5% of patients, develop HHT because of mutations in the SMAD4 gene. And this becomes a, a dual diagnosis because these patients also have juvenile polyposis. So they have JPS and HHT. HHT-like syndromes have also been described. Uh, there is significant overlap in terms of clinical presentation uh, in patients who have mutations in GDF2 and RASA1 as well. In regards to the detection rate, in somebody who has clinical features that are consistent with HHT, genetic testing would identify a mutation in 85 to 90% of patients when using sequencing or deletion duplication testing. In terms of the pathobiology of HHT, this figure shows you the signaling pathway um, of the TGF beta superfamily of ligands. You've got the surface receptor ALK1, which is what ACBL1 codes for that uh, has endoglin as a co-receptor on the endothelial surface. Uh, and when the ligand engages this, you've got phosphorylation and downstream signaling that through SMAD4 ultimately in the cytoplasm 
results in nuclear translocation of the signal. Now, when there is defective signaling down this pathway, what happens is dysregulated angiogenesis that ultimately results in the development of these, uh, development of these abnormal, dilated, uh, fragile blood vessels um, that lead to telangiectasias and AVMs. Clinical manifestations of HHT, telangiectasias um, involving mucopitinous surfaces, mouth, lips, fingers, develop in 90 to 95% of affected individuals. These then result in bleeding, and epistaxis occurs in 90% of affected individuals by age 45. GI bleeding can also develop. Typically, GI bleeding tends to be something that occurs in, with increasing age, um, typically over the age of 40, and up to 30% of affected individuals can develop GI bleeding, significant GI bleeding. A consequence of bleeding is a development of iron deficiency with or without anemia. Visceral AVMs occur in select internal organs. Pulmonary AVMs occur in 30 to 50 percent of affected individuals, can result in hypoxia, paroxysmal embolism, development of brain abscesses, osteomyelitis. Um, can, pulmonary hemorrhage from pulmonary AVMs is rare, thankfully, and an association with migraine has also been reported. Cerebral AVMs develop in 5 to 15 percent of affected individuals and can lead to hemorrhage, headaches, rarely seizures. Liver AVMs tend to be more common, uh, tend to occur with increasing age, uh, and up to 75 percent of affected individuals can have or can develop liver AVMs uh, again later on in life. Thankfully, most liver AVMs are asymptomatic, and symptomatic liver AVMs only develop in 5 to 10 percent of patients, and this can lead to biliary necrosis, high output, heart failure, and encephalopathy. Here are examples of telangiectasias, and as you can see in, in the patient with the blue arrows, these can be rather subtle, and if you don't know what it is you're looking for, they can be missed. They can either be pinpoint or more confluent, like you see in the, in, in the fingers lower down here. Um, Earlobes is another common place where these can happen. Uh, and, and under the nail bed as well, which if they bleed can be quite painful. In terms of diagnosis of HHT, it is an underdiagnosed disorder, and it is estimated that only one in 10 affected individuals carry a definitive diagnosis of HHT. Further, a significant delay in diagnosis has also been reported uh, with, the, with one study showing the delay from onset of first symptoms associated with HHT to a definitive diagnosis being 29 years with development of disease-related comorbidities during this period um, when the patient was not diagnosed. How do we diagnose HHT? Uh, you can use the clinical diagnostic criteria or Curacao criteria, which consists of these four criteria, recurrent spontaneous epistaxis, multiple telangiectasias, visceral AVNs, uh, and a family history of HHT. And if somebody has three or greater of these four criteria, then you can make a definite diagnosis of HHT clinically. If it is only two out of four, it's possible HHT. And if less than two criteria are present, it's unlikely that the person has HHT. Uh, the other avenue to, other approach to diagnosing HHT is with genetic testing for a deleterious mutation in one of the genes causing the disease. These clinical diagnostic criteria have also been validated. A word on anemia in HHT. Analysis of 680 patients that were enrolled into the brain vascular malformation HHT study identified a prevalence of anemia of 50%. A couple of things to note from this data set. If you look here, the age at diagnosis of anemia was about 38 years. Epistaxis was present in 96% of patients in this data set, and the average age of onset of epistaxis was around 14 to 16 years. GI bleeding, as I mentioned, tended to occur later on in life, and the age at onset was 47 years, 
uh, and about 17 to 30%, 17% of the overall, 30% of patients with anemia reported GI bleeding. One thing with this study was all of the data in terms of anemia, GI bleeding, epistaxis was self-reported by the patients and not objectively confirmed. So we pursued uh, uh, one other thing to mention in terms of predictors of anemia, uh, epistaxis and GI bleeding, as you would think, pre did, did predict anemia. What was interesting here was also that female gender had higher odds of developing anemia until the age of 57, beyond which there was no gender difference. Uh, and patients with an ACBRL1 mutation tended to ha have higher risk for developing anemia. Given the limitations of that initial study, we set out to do another multi-center retrospective study at three HHT centers, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, uh, University of Arkansas, and University of Utah. Uh, and we looked at the prevalence and the severity of anemia at any visit over a, over a follow-up at the center, and the average duration of follow-up in this was six years. And at the time of initial presentation for evaluation at one of these HHT centers, and we objectively confirmed anemia and looked at the severity as well, classifying anemia as mild, moderate, and severe. We found the prevalence of anemia at any visit was 43%. And at the initial visit, at initial presentation to the center was 42%. A little more about this, if you look at the blue column here, at the time of initial visit, 50% of patients had moderate or severe anemia, so hemoglobin 10 or less. And over a six-year follow-up, when you look at, at any visit, the, it was similar uh, with a 41% prevalence of moderate to severe anemia. So anemia is common, occurs in 40 to 50% of patients, uh, and half of them tend to actually be moderate or severe. In terms of management of HHD, a couple of aspects here. Um, what manage all of the things that, that you have to be thinking about in, under the management of, a, of patients with HHD, genetic counseling is important for these patients. Screening for visceral AVMs and is, in, is an important aspect or component of, of management. And there are guidelines on uh, screening, how to screen, um, when to screen, et cetera, which we won't go into in the interest of time as part of my presentation today, and not to forget antibiotic prophylaxis prior to dental procedures in patients who have not undergone screening for lung AVMs or who have undergone screening and are known to have lung AVMs is, is essential. In terms of treatment, uh, we have to be thinking about treatment of epistaxis, GI bleeding, anemia, as well as the visceral AV malformations. A word on iron deficiency without anemia. Patients with iron deficiency, even in the, when they have a normal hemoglobin, can be symptomatic and, and report fatigue, arthralgias, myalgias, restless leg syndrome, hair loss, and in the, in the pediatric population, decreased uh, uh, attention span. And in, in adults, a good number of my patients mentioned brain fog as well, it's a popular term. And iron deficiency in the setting of absence of anemia is frequently missed because if, there is, if the hemoglobin is normal on the CBC, it stops there. People don't check an iron panel or a ferritin. And doing so and, and treating iron deficiency without anemia, I think is an, I think is an important component uh, of the care of an HHD patient. In terms of management of iron deficiency anemia, as I presented earlier, the prevalence is 40 to 50%, and half of these patients have moderate or severe anemia. Aggressive management of iron deficiency in concert with minimizing bleeding risk is key. And a low threshold for use of intravenous iron replacement is important because these patients have a lifelong bleeding disorder and just oral iron replacement is often inadequate. In my practice, I target a ferritin of greater than 50 in all of my HHT patients, even in the absence of anemia, as long as there is ongoing bleeding. Finally, I wanted to list out all of the HHT centers of excellence in North America, 
There are 25 centers in the United States and four centers in Canada. Um, and the concept of HHT centers of excellence for multidisciplinary comprehensive HHT care uh, was developed by the Cure HHT Foundation in collaboration with Yale University 30 years ago. They're celebrating the 30th anniversary this year and have done a phenomenal job. With that, I will hand it over to Dr. Al Samkari to talk more about recent advances and the treatment guidelines. And Thanks very much, Raj. All right. Um, hello again, everyone, uh, once again. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to discuss treatment of HHG with everyone here today. Um, so most of my talk will focus on the true frontier of HHG therapy, which is the anti-angiogenics, um, which really have already and will continue to revol revolutionize uh, care of this not so uncommon bleeding disorder. Here are my disclosures. Uh, like Raj, I have no industry disclosures relevant to this talk, uh, but I was a member of the Second International HHG Guidelines Working Group. First, just a bit of basic HHT pathophysiology to help understand the rationale for anti-angiogenic therapy in HHT. HHT is a disease of the transforming growth factor beta pathway critical in angiogenesis, in particular endothelial cell proliferation and smooth muscle migration. HHT occurs due to mutations along the ALK1 signaling pathway. Um, ALK1 is the activin uh, receptor-like kinase family member one and is also called ACVRL1. Mutation at any of the steps along this pathway, including endoglin, ALK1, BMP9, or SMAD4, results in reduced signaling through ALK1 and increased signaling through ALK5, which tilts the balance toward incre increased VEGF production. The haploinsufficiency of these proteins, along with a second hit, like tissue injury, infection, or hypoxia, likely cause the focal vascular lesions of HHT, as reduced levels of endoglin or ALK1 cannot maintain the balance needed for normal angiogenesis and vessel maintenance. The result is disrupted vascular integrity and smooth muscle differentiation of the endothelium, resulting in abnormal and fragile vessels which readily bleed, as we know. Until relatively recently, procedural therapy was the mainstay of bleeding management in HHT and still is a very important aspect of management today. Local ablative therapies that can involve laser, electrical, or chemical cautery, sclerotherapy, or embolization are employed as temporizing therapies to provide improvements in epistaxis, which is usually partial improvement. There is a theoretical concern, uh, however, given that the signaling pathways at play that I just showed, um, that trauma could provoke a high local VEGF and possibly greater telangiectasia formation down the road. Many patients uh, have anecdotally uh, stated that this, is, this has happened to them. Surgeries employed to manage severe recurrent epistaxis included nasal septodermoplasty, which essentially involves taking a skin graft and affixing it to the nasal septum. This can be effective to reduce bleeding, but is associated with a number of potential complications. A nasal closure uh, or Young's procedure can be performed as a, what is often considered a last resort. This achieves good control of anterior nosebleeds at the cost of the sense of taste, smell, and the ability to breathe through the nose uh, in many patients. For GI tail injectasias, argon plasma coagulation can be used, but is not recommended unless the lesion is actively bleeding at the time of endoscopy. So this is primarily to address acute brisk bleeding. And, and we just remember that most HHT patients have a more chronic, gradual uh, GI bleed. The current standard of care for bleeding in HHT can be thought of in stepwise fashion, therefore. As recurrent epistaxis develops eventually in nearly all patients with HHT, moisturizing topical therapies are recommended in basically everyone. This includes saline nasal sprays, humidification of air in the home, and various moisturizing ointments that can be applied to the nares. While helpful, moisturizing topical therapy is usually inadequate to control bleeding in patients with more than mild epistaxis, and so the next step of treatment options is then considered in those patients. This consists of oral antifibrinolytics with tranexamic acid generally favored in HHT, given the greater published data for this agent, which includes two small randomized controlled trials showing modest but clear improvement in nosebleeds. Local ablative therapies, which I just mentioned before, are also included in this step as an important therapeutic option. For patients who fail oral antifibrinolytics and or oral ablative therapies, the next step is considered, which includes systemic anti-angiogenic therapies alongside more major surgical procedures like a septodermoplasty and a nasal closure. 
as you can imagine, the vast majority of patients um, will often prefer to try medical therapies uh, before considering a major surgery, but they are all considered on the same sort of line of treatment. For GI bleeding, the mainstay of treatment is systemic therapy. For mild bleeding, oral antifibrinolytics can be tried. For moderate to severe bleeding, systemic antiangiogenic therapy is often indicated. So we'll focus on systemic antiangiogenic agents uh, for the bulk of this talk, as these represent arterotherapy, NHHT, targeting the underlying pathophysiology, either indirectly or directly by blocking the VEGF pathway, which is unlike other treatment modalities. The potential promise of these agents was really first recognized over a decade ago when case reports were published of patients with HHT and malignancies being treated with chemotherapy plus bevacizumab for their malignancy. These patients were noted to have dramatic and really unexplained at the time improvements in their bleeding and anemia, which was eventually attributed to bevacizumab. And this in turn led to the development of institutional off-label treatment pathways at HHT centers to treat patients with bevacizumab. One could easily do a full talk, a uh, full hour talk just on this topic. Given my allotted time, I'm gonna focus on bevacizumab, which has the most data currently, and briefly touch upon some other antiangiogenic agents in HHT. Systemic bevacizumab is the most well-studied antiangiogenic agent used to treat bleeding in HHT. It's dosed at five milligrams per kilogram, which is generally speaking dosed at five, which is lower than the 10 to 15 milligram per kilogram doses typically used to treat patients with cancer who often receive it in combination with cytotoxic chemotherapy. In HHT, patients undergo induction with four to six every other week treatments to achieve hemostasis and induce regression of telangiectasias, followed by maintenance treatment to prevent telangiectasia and bleeding recurrence. We recognize that telangiectasias and bleeding will almost always, will almost invariably, I should say, recur if no maintenance is given. Um, there is a lot of controversy right now regarding the optimal maintenance strategy. Most centers use continuous maintenance uh, at our last evaluation, um, but some will use uh, intermittent maintenance. So a continuous maintenance is monthly infusions or every other month infusions uh, to prevent uh, rebleeding. And intermittent is a more as-needed approach, waiting for the patients to develop some kind of recurrent bleeding or iron deficiency before retreating. It really is unsettled what the best approach is. Most patients we treat experience a dramatic improvement in bleeding and anemia. Liberation from red cell transfusion and iron infusion dependence really is the norm. This is an example of one of my patients who was a fixture in our blood bank because she had been receiving transfusions every other week for years and years. We started on bevacizumab. As is often the case, her response was striking with rapid achievement of hemostasis, liberation from transfusion, and normalization of hemoglobin. It's an understatement to say that this sort of response is really life-changing for patients who experience it. Because skin and oral telangiectasias are so common, you actually can see the telangiectasias involute and fade away in many patients. This, as you can imagine, is, is really satisfying for everyone involved. Because clinical research for systemic therapies in HHT is really in its infancy, there was no established network of investigators to evaluate uh, this further. Uh, uh, and so a group of HHT investigators uh, led by myself, Dr. Kasturi, and Dr. Vivek Iyer started the first such network forming the International HHT Intravenous Bevacizumab Investigative Team, or INHIBIT, to more definitively characterize the effectiveness and safety of systemic bevacizumab in HHT. The INHIBIT bleed study is completed, and I'm happy to share those results with you. Inhibit bleed was an international 12-center observational retrospective study of HHT patients treated with systemic bevacizumab for moderate to severe chronic bleeding and anemia and HHT centers of excellence. The effective me effectiveness measures evaluated in the study included all the relevant hematologic parameters for patients who chronically bleed, including hemoglobin, red cell transfusions, and iron infusions. We also evaluated the epistaxis severity score, which is a very well-validated 10-point score measuring nosebleed severity longitudinally in HHT, where zero is no nosebleeding and 10 is the worst nosebleeding. Outcomes were compared using paired means tests in which patients served as their own internal control, uh, allowing for analysis of a large and heterogeneous group of patients with HHT. 
238 AHG patients in this study were treated with systemic bevacizumab for a median of 12 months. So patients were treated for as long as 96 months. Total of 344 patient years of bevacizumab treatment were included. Over three quarters of the patients had received prior surgical or procedural treatments for epistaxis, often multiple such treatments. Half of patients had received prior surgical or endoscopic managements for GI bleeding. Many patients had baseline comorbidities relevant to bevacizumab treatment, like hypertension, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and prior venous thromboembolism. So as you can see, um, the mean hemoglobin in patients in, in, on, uh, evaluated on this study improved from 8.6 grams per deciliter baseline uh, to 11.8 gram grams per deciliter on treatment, an increase of 3.2 grams per deciliter. Simultaneous with that, uh, the mean epistaxis severity score improved from 6.81 at baseline to 3.44 on treatment, a reduction of 3.37 points. The minimal clinically important difference in the ESS, as has been validated in prior studies, is a validation of, is a, a reduction of 0.71 points. So the mean reduction uh, saw, seen in this study was almost five times the minimal clinically important difference. Median number of red cell, red cell units transfused decreased from nine to zero during the first six months of treatment. Improvement maintained into the second six months of treatment. And the median number of iron infusion episodes decreased from eight to two during the first six months of treatment and further to zero during the second six months of treatment. So we get a lot asked a lot. This is a agent developed for use in cancer. How, uh, you know, is it safe to use it in patients who don't have cancer for, you know, oftentimes extended periods? And so the adverse event profile is really an important question. Uh, in the Inhibit Bleed study, again, 12 centers, 230 uh, plus patients, bevacizumab was overall well tolerated. 38% of patients had one or more adverse events with hypertension, fatigue, and proteinuria being the most common. There were no fatal adverse events or no increase in adverse event rates in those treated for longer durations. And the study, uh, two, uh, more than two years or less than two years was the cutoff for a uh, short versus a long duration. Venous thromboembolism occurred in just five patients getting bevacizumab. Two patients or two of these events were provoked uh, immediately following a major joint replacement surgery, a total hip or total knee. Um, and with continued bevacizumab, patients were anticoagulated without difficulty or recurrence of bleeding during anticoagulation. So these findings obviously uh, establishing the promise of bevacizumab to treat HHT, but prospective studies of bevacizumab for bleeding are obviously greatly needed. So moving on to pazopanib. Uh, pazopanib is an oral multi-target receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor with potent anti-angiogenic properties that is approval for the treatment of advanced renal cell carcinoma and certain subtypes of advanced soft tissue sarcoma. A previously published pilot study led by Dr. Marie Fonin evaluating 50 milligrams of pazopanib daily for three months in seven patients with overall moderate HHT-associated bleeding definitely suggested promise for this drug in HHT. And the figure I have in front of you on this slide is actually from another study just published in angiogenesis. Um, this was, uh, I had the pleasure of working with colleagues at the Cleveland Clinic on this study, uh, primarily Dr. Joseph Paramble, um, who led the study. This study evaluated the effectiveness of low dose oral pazopanib in 13 transfusion dependent HHT patients. Prior to starting pazopanib, 12 of these patients were on medical disability due to debilitating bleeding and severe chronic anemia. Eight had failed treatment with bevacizumab. Five had received referral to palliative care for evaluation of hospice because all other available treatment options had been explored. So the figure is here is a swimmer plot showing the hematologic support requirements for each of the 13 patients. Each lane in the plot is a patient over time. Each red circle is a, is a blood transfusion event, a red cell transfusion event. Each blue diamond is an iron infusion event. The larger the circle or the diamond, the more iron or blood was given at that event. As you can see, all patients were liberated from transfusion dependence, which was defined in the study by the Gale criteria, and most were liberated from needing any further transfusions at all, as you can see. While their hematologic support requirements did plummet, the mean hemoglobin is simultaneously improved 4.8 grams per deciliter, and the epistaxis severity score dropped 66%. Ferritin and, tra and transferrin saturation similarly improved. 
Perhaps one of the most remarkable aspects of this is how little pizopinib was needed. The starting oncologic dose of pizopinib is 800 milligrams daily. These patients were started at 50 milligrams daily, or 1 16th that dose, and the median optimal dose for uh, optimized hemostasis was 100 milligrams daily. One patient actually only needed 25 milligrams daily. So given these relatively impressive results, a national multicenter of pizopinib for bleeding and HHT is now planned. So <clears throat> the last uh, group of agents that I'm going to uh, devote some time to today are the immunomodulatory agents, so uh, thalidomide and pomalidomide. Um, so these are also called imids, and they have been shown to have relatively powerful antiangiogenic properties and also to improve blood vessel structural integrity, which would be highly relevant in HHT. So thalidomide has been evaluated uh, in HHT in a prospective phase two study with evidence for improvement in bleeding, um, but the need for indefinite treatment and the emergence of peripheral neuropathy uh, in many patients who are treated with thalidomide for long durations has ha really hampered use of this agent. But we now have newer immunomodular agents that don't have this concern like pomalidomide. Pomalidomide is a thalidomide derivative with antiangiogenic properties like its sister compound, but without the peripheral neuropathy concerns, not nearly as significant concerns. In a phase one study in which five patients were treated with pomalidomide for nine to 13 months, there was a decrease in the epistaxis severity score of greater than 50% in two patients who were treated for severe epistaxis and liberation from iron infusion and blood transfusion in patients treated primarily for GI bleeding. The PATH HHT study is a multicenter randomized US phase three clinical trial that will enroll 159 patients with HHT and randomize them two to one to receive pomalidomide or placebo. It's actually the very first large multicenter randomized trial evaluating systemic antiangiogenic therapy in HHT. Um, needless to say, um, we're, we're really excited about this study, rapidly enrolling patients, uh, both myself and Dr. Kasturi, our investigators for this study, uh, are really quite excited about the promise of uh, pomalidomide in HHT. All right, so to, this brings us really to the standard of care uh, for how uh, bleeding is managed in HHT, and this standard is reflected in the new HHT treatment guidelines, and I just want to take the last couple minutes here to share with you um, recommendations and the guidelines that are most relevant for hematologists. So these guidelines were just published in the Annals of Internal Medicine and are available at hhtguidelines.org. I strongly recommend any clinician who cares for these patients to review these new guidelines. The second international HHT guidelines focused on six topic areas, of which many are high priority to hematologists. Each topic area included about six specific recommendations. The guideline topic areas and specific recommendations of greatest relevance to hematologists I have summarized in this figure. So management of visceral arteriovenous malformations, management of pregnant patients with HHT, and other areas, obviously extremely important, very important topic areas, but beyond the scope of our current talk. Um, and those are all listed in the uh, full guidelines document that is available in the Annals of Internal Medicine, as well as hhtguidelines.org. Now, taking a look at these, you probably notice we really have already touched on most of these recommendations here uh, listed uh, on this slide throughout the prior parts of this talk, which is very much by design. We reviewed the modern uh, treatment approach to epistaxis and GI bleeding, focusing on a stepwise approach, integrating both systemic therapy and uh, procedural management, and discussed anemia and its management in HHT as well. One topic area that I'll take a little bit of time to briefly discuss is anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy, which are a source of considerable anxiety in HHT, as and uh, just about every other hereditary bleeding disorder as well. The reality is that HHT patients, if anything, based on the data we have to date, are at higher risk for thrombotic complications than the general population. And therefore, indicated, indicated anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy should be given to patients with HHT and not withheld with consideration of individual bleeding risk. And this can often you know, be somewhat complicated, right? The devil's in the details, but it is not an absolute contraindication by any stretch. And most patients are able to, to take their indicated anticoagulant or antiplatelet therapy. Generally, when anticoagulation is indicated, we prefer warfarin or heparin-based anticoagulation. As limited data to date suggests that these agents worsen HHT-associated bleeding less than direct oral anticoagulants. 
when antiplatelet therapy is indicated, the guidelines recommend against dual antiplatelet therapy if it can be avoided, and also to avoid combination anticoagulation antiplatelet therapy, again, whenever possible. In practice, patients who require chronic anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy are frequently managed with antiangiogenic therapy to control bleeding, and this strategy is really more often than not, in my experience, successful. All right, so now uh, we will uh, move on to the question and answer session. I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Kasturi to ask the first question here. All right, very good. Great job, Dr. Balsamkari. So, um, a couple of questions have come through, and I expect more will be coming. Um, the first one is, are you aware of any data regarding efficacy of biosimilars um, to bevacizumab uh, compared to bevacizumab in HHT patients? What has been your experience? Yeah, that is, a, that is an excellent question. Uh, there is no data that I am aware of that compare Avastin, which is brand name Bevacizumab, to uh, biosimilars, uh, which include Mbasi and Zerabev um, uh, and, and some others. And so, um, the, uh, uh, to my knowledge, um, uh, I, I'm not aware of data that shows that the biosimilars are equivalent or not equivalent. However, in my experience, I have used biosimilars off-label and, and really uh, uh, have seen similar uh, uh, outcomes uh, to patients that have received brand name bevacizumab. Got it, yeah, and, and just to mention, at my center at UNC, we have switched from bevacizumab to biosimilars, which is the drug on formulary right now and which all of our HHT patients get and I have not noticed any difference in efficacy. So I expect they are comparable, but again, this is not database, it's more anecdotal. All right, uh, next question. Which systemic treatments do you recommend in patients with HHT who have a history of thromboembolism? Yeah, that's that's obviously uh, <clears throat> a, a question that, uh, you know, honestly, we get all the time. You know, you sort of think about all the systemic therapies we have antifibrinolytics, which have a theoretical thrombotic risk. We have uh, uh, antiangiogenic agents, all of which I mentioned have a theoretical thrombotic risk. Um, and you know, re and realistically speaking, you know, from all the data we have, which again is primarily retrospective and observational, it really doesn't appear as though uh, there is a significantly increased risk of thromboembolic events in patients with HHT who receive these systemic therapies compared with those who don't. And in particular, we have good data for antifibrinolytics and for bevacizumab. Um, and with, I'll, I'll mention bevacizumab, you know, uh, the, the bevacizumab, uh, uh, the largest study is I, I, I presented to you, you know, uh, we had 344 patient years of therapy, five venous thromboembolic events. Um, and many of the patients in that study had a history of prior venous thromboembolism. So, um, and, and in my experience, it really does not seem when given as a single agent to patients without cancer, because it clearly does increase risk in patients who have cancer, metastatic cancer, getting it with multi-agent cytotoxic chemotherapy. But giving it to single as a single agent to patients without cancer, we haven't really, the data we have hasn't really borne out a substantially increased risk. Uh, Raj, you want to talk about tranexamic acid and amino caproic acid in HHT, given that the you know, long-term data on this comes out of your center? Yeah, we, we routinely use tranexamic acid or aminocaproic acid. Tranexamic acid much more so than amicar purely because it's easier on the patients. Um, so you're not having pills for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But it's um, effective, um, not in the very severe patients, uh, but in the moderate ESS or, or thereabouts with GI bleeding patients. Um, it's quite effective. And the longest data we have on continuous uh, antifibrinolytic therapy, uh, so our patients take them chronically. They are on full dose, two pills, three times a day, TXA, um, for years. And, and, and the longest data that we published was a patient where up to 33 months of therapy uninterrupted, safe, no, no thromboembolic events. So we use it routinely. Um, in our decision algorithms for treatment of, of these patients safely. The, what I would add to it is, I, in a 
in a patient with a history of venous thromboembolism, I would shy away from tamoxifen, which some people have used for HHT-associated bleeding, GI bleeding. Um, I would shy away from hormonal therapy, uh, which some people have used estrogen uh, quite effectively for control of bleeding. Um, and probably also the image. I'd shy away from pomalidomide, at least until the path HHT data come out. Uh, although for the path HHT, the history of venous thromboembolism is an exclusion criteria. So we, we probably won't know the safety in a patient with a history of thrombosis, but at least we'll know the incidence of thrombosis in pomalidomide treated patients. Um, I have no concerns with using bevacizumab in, in these patients. Uh, my experience has been it's quite safe, and I have not diagnosed VTE in a patient data with bevacizumab that I think is because of the drug. Um, so those would be the, that would be where I would go. Um, in the interest of time, moving on to other questions, let's, let's jump to pediatrics for a bit. Uh, what is the dose of bevacizumab in, uh, in the pediatric setting? Is it still the same five milligrams per kilo? And, and what of the safety of bevacizumab in, in pediatrics? Yeah, this is, this is what we call a data-free zone. Um, so, you know, there is not a lot of uh, data on use of bevacizumab in pediatric patients. Um, uh, and very little, I, Raj, I'm, I'm not aware of any case reports uh, uh, being published of bevacizumab and HHT in pediatrics. Um, and I know there are concerns, obviously, with the use of an antiangiogenic agent in a developing child. Um, uh, do you have other thoughts or comments on that? No, we at our center have not used bevacizumab in, in, in pediatrics um, yeah. a lot. But again, there is no, primarily because there is no need for aggressive therapy in the pediatric setting where, where it pertains to HHD. Bleeding becomes more of an age-dependent issue. And we don't see kids with, with severe bleeding requiring this aggressive therapy. So I think that's probably the reason why it's a data-free zone is because there's no need for it. Um, in other vascular malformations, there is data on the use of anti-angiogenic approaches. Um, and, and, and there, I think they seem to be safe, but not with bevacizumab, more like mTOR inhibitors, um, sirolimus. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let's jump to genetic testing. Um, what is the role of genetic testing for the diagnosis of HHT? Should genetic testing be performed in everybody? When and how would you use genetic testing? We got, we're, we're getting a lot of uh, uh, controversial questions, but it's, they're great questions. So, you know, HHT is a genetic disease that primarily is the actual gold standard diagnosis is actually a clinical criteria. Right, the Curacao criteria um, are uh, uh, the primary way that patients with HHT are diagnosed. Um, as Dr. Kasturi pointed out, genetic testing can miss up to 15% of patients with HHT. Um, nonetheless, in my practice, I still want to know people's genetics. I still uh, recommend genetic testing. Uh, HHT1, due to an endoglin mutation, uh, can have uh, different uh, manifestations in HHT2 due to an ACVR1 mutation. Um, you know, there are certain uh, types of visceral AVMs that are more common in one type versus the other type. Um, it, it, it's often helpful to know, and, and if you know somebody's mutation, that also makes it easier, obviously, to evaluate their family because that, that then becomes the next question. Um, uh, Raj, do you do you recommend testing for pretty much all of your patients, obviously after a discussion in genetic counseling? Uh, I recommend genetic testing when there is an at-risk family member uh, because it facilitates family testing and diagnosis. If I have, um, I have a small number of patients who are, who don't have siblings um, and, and there are no extended family members at risk, they don't have children, uh, in them, if it's, it's a clear clinical diagnosis, I have not pursued genetic testing because purely it's purely out of academic interest to see what their mutation is, but it, it's not going to affect practice. And in that setting, I have refrained from testing, but outside of that, we are very aggressive in testing. Uh, 75 to 80% of our patients get tested. Indeed. So one of the, one of our uh, questioners asks, we talk about uh, thalidomide, and we talked about pomalidomide, but what about lenalidomide? 
Any thoughts on yeah. lenalidomide? So it, I, I, I think lenalidomide is fine. I, I, I expect from an efficacy standpoint, uh, it would be comparable to amalidomide. The issue with the image as a group is, is the limiting factor there is toxicity and side effects. Uh, from an efficacy standpoint, um, I've treated patients with thalidomide. Um, it works, but it is so cumbersome for the patient. And, and this toxicity profile is, is not really favorable for long-term therapy. And that's been the limiting factor. So I think there is one, at least one case report that I'm aware of, of lenalidomide being used in an HHD patient and proven to be effective. So it should be fine. I, I agree. Um, so uh, another another uh, good question: Do you typically advise against cauterization of the nares uh, versus laser therapy or sclerotherapy when patients with HHT are referred to ENT? Is there is there an ablate a local ablative therapy that you prefer your patients to get? Yes, um, we try and should we recommend against silver nitrate chemical cautery. We try and avoid electrocautery uh, more from the standpoint of collateral damage to the nose over repeated use. Uh, if you're having a, a massive nosebleed and all the ER has got is silver nitrate, sure, go for it. But when you refer a patient to ENT and you're planning an intervention procedure, uh, then I would prefer for that to be in the operating room uh, with either laser or sclerotherapy. Uh, some, some sites do sclerotherapy in clinic quite well, and that's fine as well. Um, but it, 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 a cavalier approach to procedures is what I recommend against. Yeah, I, I, I echo that sentiment. Um, so uh, there is a question. Um, uh, any thoughts about the etiology of increased venous thromboembolism risk in patients with HHT? Yeah, that's, that's um, a favorite topic of mine. Uh, there, there is, um, uh, because we are currently actively looking at this in my in my in my research lab and, and in our center. The um, there is uh, they, there is one paper that suggests that there is higher prevalence uh, of venous thromboembolism in patients with HHT, not just venous arterial as well, because a slightly increased uh, prevalence of stroke in these patients too. Um, the jury, I think, is still out on whether these are actually surrogate markers of disease severity, because HHT is an endothelial disease. One Wilburn factor and one and factor eight have shown to be high in patients with HHT, um, and and there there is there is a correlation that has been shown between low iron levels, elevated factor eight, one vulnerable factor levels, and thrombosis in, in HHT patients. Um, what I don't know is whether the low iron levels and the elevated factor eight levels are together biomarkers that actually tell you that this is a more severe disease in this patient, and there is a lot more endothelial activation in this patient, and then not so much that that is what is driving thrombosis. Um, but, but more to come on this, we are actively looking at it. Hopefully, I'll publish something in a couple of years and let you know what the mechanism is. Yeah, it's a fascinating uh, uh, topic. And um, the, uh, the the question of how the contribution of iron deficiency and the potential uh, thrombotic risk of iron deficiency and thrombocytosis and iron deficiency and all of this comes up very frequently because these patients, I mean, they're, they're iron deficient for not just, you know, months or not just years, but sometimes they're iron deficient for decades. Um, and, and is there a, a, this extended duration uh, of being at risk? Um, is that uh, potentially part of the, the reason why observational studies suggest that there's, there's a higher risk of VTE in these patients? Absolutely. So here's uh, one, uh, two that are related, I think. Um, do you find menorrhagia is, is a common finding in patients, women with HHT? Along those lines, what are understudied areas? Um, I think they both go together because menorrhagia and HHT needs more attention. Uh, what are yeah. other um, clinical research areas in HHT that need attention? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> both excellent questions. 
Um, so I, you know, to my knowledge, there has not been a, a really uh, formal look on the burden of menorrhagia in patients with HHT. I have a number of patients with HHT who do have uh, uterine AVMs um, and who have really dramatic menorrhagia that is, uh, diff you know, has not been well explained uh, by typical gynecologic etiologies like fibroids and things like that. Um, and, you know, we have to be careful because, you know, uh, the, when patients with HHT are very anemic and chronically anemic, the first thing we think is, oh, you have GI bleeding, a uh, cold GI bleeding, which is almost always uh, uh, the cause. But there are certainly cases where uh, there actually isn't a whole lot of GI bleeding and it's actually, you know, a, a younger woman who has this and, and, and menorrhagia has, is, is more of a contributor than was originally recognized. So um, it, it, that's definitely one area that uh, uh, is, is, you know, definitely needs more, more uh, uh, study. Um, I mean, a lot, just in terms of the second question, uh, you know, Raj, you can comment on your opinion on this. I mean, there are so many frontiers in HHT. We, we uh, you know, in, in addition to therapies, we need prospective clinical trials. And so for so many of our therapies, um, uh, we need, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, really uh, uh, improved and, and stronger prevalence assessments in HHT, um, uh, really understanding uh, uh, to, a, to, I think, a higher level the prevalence and incidence of this disease worldwide. Um, we have estimates, uh, but it's not perfect. Um, uh, you know, I think there's, there are, uh, we need a very large uh, HHT database uh, with, with, you know, uh, a, a contribution of uh, centers from around the world uh, to evaluate uh, hematologic manifestations, bleeding, anemia, all of those things. We, we do lack that. Your Absolutely. thoughts, Roger? No, no, I agree. And, and also, Bear in mind, there is a lot of phenotypic heterogeneity that we still haven't quite figured out. Um, the same mutation running in, in family members. Uh, I know people in the family that have really bad bleeding or transfusion dependent and others barely bleed. Uh, their primary HHT causing mutation is the same. So why the heterogeneity? And, and there's still, there's work going on there in terms of genotype phenotype correlations and identifiers or predictors of heterogeneity just to understand it better. Um, and then there are there are groups around the world working on this. So watch the space. I think in the next five to ten years, uh, a lot more to come. Um, one question which I will grab here is: Are there goals to educate hemophilia treatment centers to take care of HHT patients, as there are more HTCs than HHT centers of excellence? Um, that is not a planned question. That's a fantastic question <laughs> though, because we currently have a study that is supported by the CDC that's ongoing, where we are piloting comprehensive HTC care uh, at, uh, sorry, HHT care at HTCs um, the, at, at Indiana, the Indiana uh, Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center and the University of Michigan HTC are the two pilot sites. Um, and so more to come on that space as well. But if we can prove that this can be done, then absolutely, I think HTCs should absolutely take care of HHT patients. Um, why not? They've got almost all of the pieces needed in place and, and decades of experience on how to do this well. Absolutely. absolutely. And with that, um, I think that's a great place uh, to conclude. We're at the top of the hour. Um, so uh, uh, both Dr. Kasturi and I um, would like to thank all the participants on today's call for joining us to learn more about HHT. Uh, and joining us in this conversation. We thank our colleagues at the CDC's Division of Blood Disorders for this invitation to speak on HHT. And we also thank the Hemophilia Foundation of America for hosting today's webinar. So uh, if you have additional questions about this webinar series or today's presentation, please contact Cynthia Sayers uh, at the email address uh, here listed on the slide. Um, this webinar will be archived and access accessible uh, soon on the CDC's webinar archive site, again, also as shown on this slide. Thanks once again, everyone, uh, and thank you uh, for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.